talking about uh, partially talking about nanofabrication and largely and, uh, talking a lot about some specific aspects of ultrafast uh, magnetic acoustics. Uh, I have skipped a lot of uh, discussion talking about surface acoustic wave and surface magnetic acoustics, although we have uh, a lot of uh, a lot of experiments and a lot of data analysis. All understanding basically comes from physics of surface waves, but I will give a short introduction about elementary ultrafast magnetism and elementary magnonics, as it is probed in ultrafast uh, experiments, and about elementary acoustics, and have two major parts, which will be about femtosecond laser-driven uh, magnetoacoustic magnetization dynamics, uh, taking as an example uh, a benchmark experiment uh, of, of a single uh, phononic and magnonic cavity at the same time, and providing uh, quantitative fitting and interpretation of uh, the last uh, paper of Jean-Yves Bigot on, on, on this uh, subject. And then the last part will be actually about fabrication of suspended membranes, which appear to be the structures that we need to advance the field uh, in the future. It will be all, all optical manufacturing, all optical probing. It is all, all optical, all magneto. So the first part, about elementary magnetism and elementary magnonics. You probably uh, have seen uh, several of uh, these uh, slides uh, many, many times. Uh, here is an introductory slide showing the dependence of uh, saturation magnetization uh, on temperature uh, with the Curie point. There are a lot of scaling exponents, alpha and beta, which are related to magnonics, Kittel, the physics of the six, uh, 1960, 1970, and the breakthrough uh, all static. So if you, if you heat it up uh, slowly, you, you demagnetize and you, you, you cool it down, you remagnetize and so on. And the breakthrough came from uh, the experiment of Jean-Yves Bigot, 1996, showing that this uh, demagnetization, uh, which is thermal or not, uh, can be uh, uh, occur on ultra-fast scales, on the sub picosecond time scales. Uh, and then recovery slow is, is determined by some uh, thermal uh, diffusion uh, dynamics. Another benchmark experiment was the observation by, by the group of Bert Kopmans back in 2002, who has shown that in some particular cases, ultra short laser pulses can not only induce the demagnetization dynamics, but also induce a complex precessional dynamics, which is not solely limited to the ferromagnetic uh, resonance precession, but contains several modes. And the second mode has been identified as a, as a mode of an exchange magnon of a perpendicular standing wave mode across the film, thin ferromagnetic film, and it, it, is, it will be one of the driving uh, uh, main objects of uh, this, our investigation. So in order to model these femtosecond laser-induced effects, how it depends, how the magnetization, there, there are many different pathways. There is a time-dependent length of magnetization, driven either by thermal effects or superdiffusive currents or other. There is a time-dependent direction of magnetization vector inducing the FMR precession, and there is also spatial and homogeneity of the magnetization dynamics, which we are going to uh, decompose in, in magnons and our simplified uh, representation. So here is a little bit of the theory. The, the working horse is uh, the landau lifshitz uh, gilbert equation, which describes the precession of a magnetization vector, potentially time-dependent, around the effective magnetic field, which also depends on time. And uh, there is a Gilbert damping term proportional to Gilbert damping. This Gilbert damping is also essential as it determines the quality factor of magnetic resonances. And we are going to introduce other quality factors uh, here in this study as well. So it is an entirely complicated study and it would be nice at least to get rid of, uh, of this uh, temperature dependence uh, of, of magnetization vector. And this is why magnetoacoustics will be an important uh, study. So still the first experiment has been done by a thermal uh, uh, launching of uh, magnetization. And this is, these are uh, 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 magnetic eigenmodes, a thin ferromagnetic film of a thickness D. And there are eigenmodes, uh, especially homogeneous FMR mode, the first or the magnon mode. Uh, these are just eigenmodes in a quant like in quantum mechanics. Obeying free boundary conditions, this is one of possible assumptions. Typically, our results are independent on the boundary conditions. We can assume also pinning or some mixed uh, boundary conditions as well. What is essential about magnons is that their frequency as a function of a k-vector or magnon order uh, scales quadratically. And this uh, 
This coefficient is the exchange stiffness D, uh, which, is, uh, uh, which is an important uh, quantity. We have used the same type of experiment back in 2019 uh, in order to do a magnon spectroscopy in complex magnetic material using uh, gadolinium doped permalloy and uh, trying to quantify uh, uh, Gilbert damping alpha and uh, exchange stiffness uh, D, how it depends on uh, the, the uh, concentration of, of, of gadolinium in, in this structure. So this type of magnon spectroscopy works very well. We see many magnons in our optical pump probe experiment. So it is a uh, quantitative uh, tool. So now I'm switching to uh, femtosecond laser driven magnetoacoustics uh, because we have also other tools except for an ultra fast heating. The second uh, most important excitation will be uh, uh, acoustic pulses. So this is the origin of ultra fast acoustic, the experiment of Thompson and Hume Primaris back in 1986, where they have excited a thin layer of, uh, uh, I think it was a semiconductor, but an optically opaque uh, material with an ultra short laser pulse to launch uh, acoustic pulses. And you see here, this is a cartoon of, uh, uh, of atomic planes that is propagating when the, the distance between the planes is small, the material is compressed. When the distance between the small, the material is, is, uh, is stretched. So you are basically generating a bi the so-called bipolar pulses. The compressional part is followed by the, uh, uh, by the uh, dilution part. And these acoustic pulses are bouncing back and forth, typically experiencing a partial reflection at an interface uh, with a substrate. So, and typically the acoustics is quantified by, by a sequence of equal. There is a first acoustic equal, second acoustic equal, third acoustic equal, that correspond to the successive round trips of acoustic pulses through the investigated uh, layer. One could do it a little bit more quantitative, uh, quantitatively, this is why we have this, uh, uh, some, some of these nice papers uh, back in 2012, 2013. Uh, but I'm going to tell you the story about how these ultra short phonon pulses interact uh, with magnetization and how we can, uh, we can treat phonons and magnons on equal footing. So far, for, for technical reasons and for historical reasons, we are thinking in terms of an ultra short acoustic pulse that is propagating through some ferromagnetic material. So here is an acoustic pulse in one dimension. Uh, this is epsilon ZZ, this is a strain component uh, as a function of Z, the propagation distance and the function of time. And it interacts uh, with magnetization, which is, can be decomposed in magnon modes following this Gilbert Landau uh, Lifshitz equations and so far. So we have an acoustic pulse, an acoustic delta pulse, which is interacting with individual magnonic, uh, magnonic eigenmodes. And it, was, it is actually the concept, the, the, the picture, which is superimposed by experimental observations by uh, Van Kampen and by Thompson uh, using acoustics. And we are going to see how to do it better. So in this picture, uh, we can calculate everything uh, using this, uh, using this Landau, uh, numerical solutions of landau lifshitz gilbert equation to see that when an acoustic pulse is propagated through an ultra-thin layer of a ferromagnetic material, it will uh, excite the magnetization dynamics, which consists out of very, very many modes, high frequency mode, and these high frequency modes, uh, there are really many of them, they can go up to the terahertz. So the question of the spectral bandwidth is also quite trivial to solve. So we basically generate all magnon modes within the spectral bandwidth of acoustic pulses. For example, these dashed areas show that if an acoustic pulse uh, has a duration of three picoseconds, it has a spectrum going up to say typically three to 400 gigahertz. If it becomes a single picosecond pulse, it goes or it covers the entire range up to one terahertz. So basically all magnon modes are excited and uh, the results of analytical simplification of gilbert landau lifshitz equation show that uh, this uh, dynamics of individual magnon modes can be described as a dynamics of a damped, uh, externally driven harmonic oscillator with some uh, com complicated external force, but still it is a very simple, simple equation. So, uh, so it is all well documented. We understand basically the theory. We understand now that it's, magnons should always be excited. Even we do understand a little bit the fact that why here the, uh, some magnon modes are excited better than the others. 
uh, the phase matching conditions uh, between phonons and magnons helps helps a little bit, but this is not essential. So, but it is not the the, the story. The story will be uh, now about what could be interesting in terms of using these acoustic pulses. In this concept, uh, assuming that we have uh, uh, short bursts of uh, ultra short uh, 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 phonons, and here uh, as a benchmark study back in 2013, this was our first. Theoretical calculation: We have we have looked at the possibility of an acoustically induced uh, magnetization switching uh, between uh, these uh, different. Uh, this is acoustically induced reorientation phase transition. The question has been raised uh, during the last talk. So here uh, uh, there is a, we have taken as, as a benchmark experiment a single uh, crystal uh, terphenol terbium iron layer, uh, which is characterized uh, due to the anisotropy by four in-plane metastable energy minima, one, two, three, and four, and have calculated how the dynamics of magnetization, how it involves when the, an acoustic uh, phonon burst is passing through a very thin layer of its terphenol uh, layer. And the, the, the conclusion was uh, uh, quite interesting, meaning that a single, a single acoustic pulse could result switching between different states, depending on the polarity of the pulse, if it was compressional pulse or tensile strain pulse, it could induce uh, uh, magnetization switching between all these different states. Yeah. We got it through in the PRL, although the comment of one of the, one of the referees was you are doing it in a straightforward way. Uh, there is nothing interesting about that because you need to have a material with giant magnet restriction coefficient like terphenol D and you need to have giant acoustic pulses of is an amplitude up to three gigapascal, one strain, uh, one percent strain pulses. It is not interesting in terms of applications. This is why I have been thinking for about uh, seven years and came up with a much better, uh, better proposal with better realistic calculation uh, how to do low power. And this is a question mark that is still not low power surface acoustic wave pulse driven magnetization switching. And here the design is the following. Uh, if you uh, focus an ultra short laser pulse uh, in a thin line, for example, using, using a cylindrical lens, it is going to generate ultra short pulses of surface acoustic waves, and you can let, let them interact with a, with a single nanomagnet of an elliptic shape, where due to the shape anisotropy, this is a bistable system, uh, uh, where this bistability, uh, the potential, the, the depths of both potentials and their distance, the distance between them can be controlled by an external magnetic field of the amplitude of a few millitesla. So, and then we come up with uh, something which is quite interesting. This is a switching uh, diagram uh, showing that under some particular, for some particular durations of acoustic pulse and its amplitude, there is either switching or not switching, uh, which are, which are uh, described by the different colored zones. But the color of these zones also shows the time switching. So in, this is a nice system because it, we can get into the regime of non-precessional switching, ultra-fast switching, where the switching time is below the uh, stationary FMR precession. Yeah? And the reason for that is quite simple, because when you, when you are applying the strain to this uh, nanomagnet and the strain is strong enough, although now strong enough will be 10 to the minus 4 orders of magnitude lower. And this is not for terphenol, but this is for nickel, for which the, the, uh, the magnet restriction coefficient is also two orders of magnitude lower. So here we are several orders of magnitude, typically four orders of magnitude lower in strain as compared to our previous study. So anyway, what happens here? If you have a bistable potential and you start shaking it, depending on how you shake and which direction, you can transitly convert it to the single, uh, single state, single well state, and then it is going the single well stake back and forth. It is transient phase transition where you can have sub 100 picosecond switching times. Now the big question is now how, how we can go really in terms of power consumption, how we can combine uh, the attempt to getting down to the Landauer level in the static, in, in static thermodynamics and uh, still have reasonably uh, high uh, fast switching times. Okay. It was just an intro. Now we came back to, uh, to Earth from this, from this consideration. The experiment is doable, so we don't have means to do that, but if somebody wants to do, it's gonna work, no, because it's, uh, everything is uh, appropriate. 
So we started thinking about now resonantly enhanced phonon uh, uh, magnon interactions. And uh, the reason uh, for that is, is the following because we have uh, uh, very nice students now at the Ecole Polytechnique who uh, are motivated to do simple things and useful things. And for historical reasons, our, our uh, the structures of interest have always been metal ferromagnet bilayers. And here we have uh, taken, uh, uh, taken a look at a nickel gold uh, uh, bilayer excited with femtosecond laser pulses. And you see uh, the, the, the simulation results are quite straightforward. With an ultra short uh, optical pulse, you can excite the nickel layer, then you generate an acoustic pulse, going back and forth, back and forth. And the interesting thing was in the simulations was that we, uh, we did not take into account the substrate. It was a, 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 a magnet acoustic cavity, right? where the phonons have been confined by 100% reflection at nickel air interfaces and gold air interfaces. So we have freestanding nickel layers, we have isolated standing modes, and we have elastic boundary conditions at an interface between nickel and gold, which gave rise to something interesting, which we still don't understand. So the acoustic eigen modes are, and the structures are non-orthogonal, but these things happen uh, in, in life. So now it was interesting to see how we can quantify now of phonon magnon interactions using the qualitative concept uh, developed in the Manfred Bias group by, uh, by Bombeck et al., who said that it's actually in order to have efficient uh, phonon magnon interactions, you need to have the same frequencies and you need to have uh, some, some mode overlap conditions should be fulfilled. So, and this is our question was, can we quantify it? So then we did all the simulations, have quantified and came up with uh, some interesting con uh, conclusion that uh, we could have a symmetry broken uh, structure with nickel gold, or we could form this uh, symmetric structure, uh, just that distributing gold on both sides of, uh, of nickel. This is also a concept that may be important for, for magnetic plasmonic applications. And in terms of, uh, in terms of magnetoelastic interactions, here you see the frequency of magnetoelastic response as a function of an external value of an external magnetic field going from zero to three Tesla. And you see that in the symmetric structure, the, 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 there were much less resonances observed. And the reason for that is the following, that these overlap integrals due to the symmetry of the mode, they have been canceled uh, for symmetry reasons for half, for half of resonances. Meaning that in these structures, or where uh, in anti-symmetric structures, asymmetric structures, you would have partially overlapping uh, resonances, which are indistinguishable. However, in symmetric structures of the same total thickness, you would have isolated resonances which could be distinguished and which could be used also to identify phonon magnon interactions in, from the experimental data. So, and then we have looked at this experiment that didn't give us any, at least me personally, uh, any, uh, uh, so I didn't sleep well uh, because of this experiment, because it's exactly what Bigot and Kim did back, back in 2017. This is uh, Jivan uh, Bigot, he's now at the university in South Korea, and they did an experiment in a freestanding nickel film of, of uh, 300 nanometer thickness. And you see in terms of the model, there is an acoustic pulse back, bouncing back and forth, etc., etc. The upper trace here is this, uh, these are acoustic echoes, the first echo, the second echo, the third echo, and so on. And on beneath, there are, there are traces of magnetization dynamics obtained for different orientation of external magnetic field. What is surprising here, normally in, if in, in this type of time domain picture, when the acoustic pulse arrives, there should something happen to the magnetization. But you see in these two traces, in the green one and the red one, the acoustic pulse arrives and the second acoustic pulse arrives and literally nothing happens. So it's just an uh, oscillation that grows slowly and decays slowly meaning that this is probably not the best uh, possible interpretation, not the best possible prism to look through at this data by, by assuming that we have short acoustic pulses and uh, isolated eigenmodes. So one of the other interesting questions was that it was literally impossible using this concept to discriminate between uh, uh, FMR modes and uh, mag spatially homogeneous magnon modes just because in the time domain, the frequency distance was very small between them. So for thick 
uh, layers, uh, the spacing, spectral spacing between the modes is very small. It was literally impossible to, to, to say what, what all these oxidations were about. So they have all been interpreted as uh, ferromagnetic resonance oscillation. No? And this is where we started applying our, uh, our uh, model, uh, just started looking at this data as if it were an acoustic cavity. And you see that if you take a Fourier transform of this uh, reflectivity spectra containing up to 12 echoes, you get very well isolated, spectrally isolated standing phonon modes. Uh, you can uh, do the fitting, quantify them with, now with help of two brilliant uh, second year bachelor students who are very good in fitting. So and the fits that are literally indistinguishable from the experimental data, probed on both sides, on the upper side of the film and on the lower side of the film, they are identical to experimental data. And this is a result of a decomposition of acoustic strain in uh, acoustic eigenmodes. And this is how it works. So the strain is propagating up and down, up and down, up and down, is damped out, but well, this is what comes out. Now, uh, all the acoustic modes have been quantified in terms of their frequencies, in terms of their uh, line widths, in terms of their acoustic Q factors. And uh, the question was, how do these acoustic mode, modes uh, interact with, uh, with magnon modes? And it, here I'm, I'm highlighting again this role of uh, symmetries in magnetoacoustics. You see that uh, in symmetric structures, both phonon modes and magnon modes can be, uh, uh, can be uh, uh, split or uh, have two subsets of, uh, of eigenmodes, symmetric eigenmodes, uh, mirror symmetric eigenmodes, and mirror antisymmetric eigenmodes. And all of that, irrespective of boundary conditions for magnon mode. People are always asking why are you using free boundary conditions? I said, because they are most reasonable ones to use and nothing depends on them. Yeah? And here you see that these overlap integrals uh, as a function of the acoustic uh, mode number and uh, magnonic mode number, they have, half, they have a lot of zeros. Yeah? Meaning that symmetric phonon modes uh, interact only with symmetric uh, 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 magnon modes and antisymmetric only with antisymmetric. And this is the key to the quantitative and physical interpretation uh, of the results. So here is quantitative fitting of experimental data obtained now for, for two different uh, values of the magnetic field. So the magnetization dynamic starts growing. This is when you start driving a harmonic oscillator periodically, it has a certain time Need, needs to, 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 to be the stage to get to the stationary solution. And then as a driving force decays, at a later time, the, this driven magnetization dynamic decays. So there is this uh, raise time of, uh, which can be associated to Gilbert damping and decay time uh, which, from which we extract this uh, Q, acoustic Q factor of the order of 30. And this is uh, resonantly enhanced interaction. Now you would say, what's the difference? There is no difference uh, just because here, the green curve is a little bit uh, higher frequency and the red curve is the behavior is similar, but not the behavior is not similar. I'm not, I'm only going to show you the case uh, for this green curve for the second resonance. If you do a uh, magnet optical measurement on both on opposite sides of the film, you see that the signals is phase shifted, meaning that whenever the magnetization is pointing up, the dynamically on the up on the opposite side, it's pointing down. And this is an ind indication for for this uh, exchange mode. So to summarize it in a, in a single slide, and this is the first uh, paper that we have devoted to the memory of Jean-Yves Bigot. This is a simulation, uh, magnet optical frequency as a function of uh, the angle of external magnetic field. And you see that these two resonances, one at 10 gigahertz, another 20 gigahertz, uh, driven by uh, acoustic modes of different symmetry. P1 is a symmetric mode, P2 is an antisymmetric mode, they correspond to here to, uh, so this is low, lowest mode here at 15 degrees is an upper one. You see it is primarily spatially homogeneous mode. And uh, the second resonance corresponding to this 60 degrees angle is here. It generates uh, this antisymmetric mode dominated by the first order magnon resonance. Meaning that this is an interpretation of uh, published experimental data by Kim and Bigot, which shows that this is the first unambiguous experimental demonstration of phonon and magnon interaction where everything fits quantitatively. So, and this is now end of the story uh, for about, uh, about this ultra fast magnetoacoustics. We would need freestanding layers to do this type of experiments and we would need 
to have thin freestanding layers in order to go to higher frequencies to, 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 to see if uh, we can do ultra fast magnetoacoustics in the terahertz frequency way. And it is difficult. And this is why I'm coming now to the second part of the talk. Uh, we have figured out the way in the lab to produce uh, quasi freestanding membranes using again, single femtosecond uh, uh, laser pulses. So the idea is uh, actually quite, uh, quite trivial and it has been driven by, uh, by an observation from engineering community. Uh, so it, this is a 100 uh, micrometer thin uh, aluminum field. And if you excite it from the backside with an acoustic pulse, you would have, you would create a closed uh, uh, bubble. And this is called a spallation bubble. And the reason for that is the following. So the acoustic pulse, which is a giant compression wave, if you deposit a lot of energy, it basically generates a shock wave. The shock wave propagates through the material from one side that has been generated to another one. And upon reflection from the free interface, it changes the sign out of the compressive pulse, you will, you will uh, generate a tensile pulse. And this tensile pulse, it propagates back. And at some point, uh, its value, its tension exceeds the critical tension of the material. So basically you disrupt the material at some point where the material cannot sustain any tension anymore. Dynamically, huh? an experiment done uh, with, uh, uh, in 2001 by Tamura et al, Journal of Applied Physics. And I think at home you could, could have the very same thing if you want to break your, your glass, window glass, you take a hammer, kick on one side and the, the destruction will, be, will start from the back side for the same reason, it is spallation. So now we, we, we thought, can we downscale this type of uh, uh, mani microfabrication technology down to the nanoscale? And before doing that here, I'm just reminding you that an essential thing here is the applied laser fluids for magnetic acoustics. We have been applying fluids of, uh, of the order of one millijoule per square centimeter. The same for all optical magnetization switching. In order to damage the material, to nanostructure them, we, we need to apply uh, fluences, which are orders of magnitude higher, huh? but they are routinely available in the lab. So then we do uh, the experiment uh, on a 300 nanometer nickel thin film. And this is an optical microscopy. We see that here there are some structures, black, uh, this is a ref optical microscopy and reflection, meaning that uh, the black areas correspond to, 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 to the holes in the surface. So we, behind there is a uh, glass substrate. So we have completely removed uh, the entire film. And then as we progressively decrease the fluence, there is also something going on uh, at, in this intermediate fluence range. So, but what, what we did, we tried to understand what's going on. We have done all these uh, electron microscopies. I've seen that actually when we are applying too much fluence, it is uh, basically similar to if you take a knife and you have uh, an aluminum foil and you break it through, with a, it will be just freestanding flakes. So these are freestanding nickel flakes on top of a hole. And there is also some, something interesting happening in, in between. So that means the nickel film, the nickel film has, was split in the middle. It was not what completely detached from the surface. It was a new mechanism of thermal, thermal mechanical splitting. Well, but it was not about our study. Our study was primarily about what's, what's going on uh, in these uh, regimes where do not, we do not make a hole. Can we make closed cavities at the nanoscale using single femtosecond laser pulses? And the answer is, uh, uh, of course, yes. And this is how they look like. This is a transmission, uh, no, uh, this is a scanning electron microscopy of a, of a bubble, which has been cut by a focused ion beam and you see that the structures in aluminum uh, observed with optical microscopy because it's micrometers time scale, they are very similar to those uh, observed uh, at the nanoscale using uh, uh, scanning electron microscopy. And with the only uh, difference that here now the, the bubble is formed, uh, it splits very close to the, to the surface where it has been excited. And here is a molecular dynamic simulation uh, done by uh, Professor Ivanov, or the same method as uh, Tatiana Itina is using in uh, Laboratoire Hubert Curien, who showed that if we excite a 300 nanometer layer of nickel uh, back uh, through the glass substrate, you melt uh, a third of the film basically. And upon expansion, uh, there is also the fraction, uh, so there is a separation 
between the melted part and unmelted part, part and under certain conditions, the entire film is split, uh, flows away from the surface. And in this particular case, something is left over on the surface and the freestanding uh, layer is just on top. So it was quite an encouraging observation. And uh, we had another brilliant student, the first year master student, Stefan Lemperia, uh, who did a lot of, uh, a lot of experiments in, in the lab using optical interferometry techniques uh, in order to quantify a zoo of uh, uh, nanostructures obtained by irradiating through picosecond and femtosecond laser pulses of 300 nanometer freestanding layers. So the experimental technique uh, was a version, an upgraded version of linear microinterferometer. Basically, the advantage of this technique is that you can look at surface profile both at the front side and at the back side of the, of the surface. So this is unique. You cannot do IFM uh, uh, from, the, from the glass side, from the substrate side. But here, optically, you can do it. There are uh, structures that are different, so all the profiles are different. But in some particular cases, he identified the structures that have been really the entire nickel film separated from the glass. And this red curve is interferometric measurements from the upper side. Uh, from the air side and the back uh, uh, side is a green, meaning that here we have a quasi freestanding layer of, uh, of nickel with a thickness of 300 nanometers on the typical uh, length scales of a few microns. Uh, of course, this is not the only geometry. We can do a lot of other uh, experiments. We can uh, play with, with the shape of uh, laser focus, providing lines uh, or uh, line uh, like bubbles and, and making periodic arrangements. Uh, so meaning that we have basically created many diffraction gratings yeah, out of these bubbles. Yeah. And uh, these diffraction gratings, they are potentially interesting for applications both in high frequency and low frequency uh, magnetoplasmonics. For low frequency magnetoplasmonics and sensing, uh, the key point was actually that if we do COMSOL simulations, uh, these bubbles, freestanding bubbles, these are drum modes. These are basically those uh, la uh, lamp modes that are propagating. So acoustic cavity here in is transversal, is made out of lamp modes. It has frequencies uh, uh, up to uh, around 200, 200 megahertz. Uh, in this particular case, we have been able to observe uh, modulation frequency up to one gigahertz. Very interesting in terms of applications. So, and then uh, they, correspond to large modulation of diffraction efficiencies on these gratings, which is orders of magnitude higher as compared to static gratings, because when you excite them with femtosecond pulses, these bubbles start vibrating as the drums, and this induces large modulation of uh, diffraction efficiency. So this is a flexible or bendable or addressable uh, diffraction gratings. Uh, and with that, I conclude in the sense that we have one interesting experiment, the experimental system uh, in terms of uh, well understood in terms of uh, experiments and, and modeling, which is a freestanding uh, layer of uh, say nickel, sandwiched or not with gold, this is for technical reasons, which with which we could go up to uh, frequencies of at least half a terahertz, if we had uh, freestanding layers that are thin enough. Now the next goal is to produce these freestanding layers that is thin enough. At the, at the moment, we can uh, get down to 100 nanometers, but probably this is not the limit. And this is our uh, future work. And then, of course, a lot of effort has been put on uh, ultra fast acoustic microscopy and magnet acoustic microscopy development. Three years of work now. The results are not yet there because it's experimental science. I hope to be uh, able to deliver uh, some new results uh, by the end of this year with our uh, new PhD student. Uh, so why is this terahertz acoustics important? It's also important for blue sky research. We, with Jean-Eric Redrov and Alexey Lomonosov, we did some simulations for, uh, for the so-called inertial mutation magnons, Nature Physics 2021 about inertial effects, Nature Physics 2023 about the same, but with exchange magnons, spin, orbit, uh, spin orbitronic, toxic and interfaces. These excitations, in the uh, sub terahertz frequency range are important. And here there is another possibility, which would be this uh, second branch of uh, inertial magnons. And the question would be if we would be able to observe uh, interaction of uh, uh, acoustic modes with this uh, second, second branch of inertial 
magnet. And with that, I would like to thank all people that have been funding us. So I have spent uh, very many years in Le Mans, uh, Université du Maine, where we had our collaboration map was like Pays de la Loire, Paris, Paris did not exist at the moment, and we have been collaborating with Boston, Constance, and, and a lot of uh, other universities in Germany, have organized two workshops, and it was quite productive. And during that time, we basically developed theoretical understanding of this ultrafast magnetoacoustics. So it would be relatively easy, straightforward to organize the same type of meeting now at the Cold Polytechnique, where we get uh, support from physics department and also some support for INR. Uh, to mount international uh, collaborations. And uh, I thank you very much for your uh, attention. And as Janiv uh, was right, you see, uh, he always said, c'est nickel. Tout, tout était nickel. Uh, well, merci pour votre attention. <laughs> from the audience online or in physically present yes there <laughs> thank you for a very nice talk i have practically two questions the first one is what is the minimal diameter of the cavities you can receive in principle we can so here you have an example of a, of a grating, so you don't see the scale, but the distance between these two bubbles is 1.8 microns, so they, they are deeply submicron. Yeah? Uh, so the threshold nature of the phenomena means that using uh, optical pulses, so this is the same type of like this super resolution by, 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 by Stefan Hell. Whenever you have a threshold, you are unlimited in your spatial resolution, you see the this is determined by the typical structures, the typical size here. Uh, I would guess 100 nanometers, but when you have 100 nanometers, this is already the size of, the, of, the, of, some, of some bubbles that are naturally emerging. So I think for practical applications, one micron and, and above uh, would be good size, yeah? controllable size. Uh, second question, a follow up. And I want to ask, uh, what is the laser which you use for these applications? What is the type of the probably femtosecond laser? Any ultra short laser with affluence in the range of uh, say what what was it about one joule per square one joule per square centimeter? Here, for example, there is. We have used ultra short laser pulses with a certain pulse duration. And then, but you know, you are asking about some secrets now. Yeah. Don't try to reproduce it. You are going to there, I'm not going to share this secret. This is secret. Yeah? But generally, it's very simple. It is a question of what you want to get with these structures. There are many labs in Germany and also in, in France that are producing similar types of structures without even noticing that they have them. Yeah. It is a question, what do you want in terms of thickness, sizes? Then you come, we talk, you sign the disclosure agreement and you get the sample. Yeah? I'm not doing it differently, sorry. Yeah. Question uh, from Nico. Uh, uh, maybe I, I missed a bit of the previous one, but um, so, so this is pure, a pure uh, nickel. Ah, nickel and glass, okay, okay. Okay, so that answers my question, <laughs> yes. Okay, but uh, yeah, I have another one. And then um, from a mechanical point of view, I guess that, that uh, I don't know, because it is, it is melted at some point, but maybe not entirely. It is partially melted and this is actually melted now okay, but, here. Okay. So probably there, there are a lot of uh, residual stresses in, in, inside the material. And do you think uh, it has an effect on the, on the many properties. Uh, and here, I, th this is actually the offer to the community because we do not have neither manpower nor uh, technological means to investigate these properties except for uh, doing uh, MOC microscopy. So for MOC microscopy, we did not see any, anything uh, challenging on uh, 
uh, in nickel, but uh, thinking of different materials like binary alloys, uh, terphenol D. So it, is, it will be definitely very, very interesting to look at the magnetic properties here. And the reason is the following. Here, we expect uh, the, this bubble to be filled with ultra high vacuum. S saturated pressure at room temperature of nickel is 10 to the minus 27. Then you don't even think what the, the, the units are, 10 to the minus 27. There is nothing. Meaning that this part of the material has been uh, melted and resolidified under high vac vacuum conditions. This is an extremely clean way to fabricate new states of matter. And uh, we can look through them uh, at them uh, from the bottom optically uh, and probably magnetoacoustically as well. Here, this is an, an open bar for those who want to get these structures. Yeah. I have a very naive question uh, how, about um, long-term stability of such a bubble. Do you, can you estimate that? <laughs> even longer than if, if it exists in, even in Czech Republic and in Germany. And in the, so one of the projects that we had would be breaking these bubbles with IFM cantilever, with, with diamond tips. And we have been trying so hard in Lemos. I've spent so many hours trying to, uh, unbreakable, totally unbreakable. And we have done pump probe measurements uh, uh, on, on vibrating bubbles. They are still alive. So uh, they are still alive and they still produce the same results as on the first, on the first day of when they have been. Because, because of the spatial scale, you, you, think, you, you may think that this is uh, like Notre Dame de Paris. Eh? in terms of mechanical stability. Extremely thick walls, 300 nanometers, and extremely small dimensions, say, of about one micron. Extremely rigid. And this is a big problem because these rigid structures, they cannot be very flexible. So we can get more flexible, but then they are going to be less rigid. And at some point, also the atmospheric pressure is going to, to impact there. So there is a lot of potential. So we need to play with the, with the diameter in order to to determine the rigidity, it becomes. And then, uh, this came to, came to my mind. And then what would be, because I see one micron, you, you talk about dimensions, yes, one, one micron. What, one micron. Yeah, okay. So what do you, you think, is it, uh, is it some fixed or? If you do that on sapphire, it might not work. So we have it on sapphire, ah, okay. the results are a little bit better. Ah, okay. okay. Uh, this is on lead on sapphire, there is not a point of any difference. Okay. Uh, so and, and, yeah. Okay. I'm asking this, uh, the dimension thing, because maybe it might be a useful way to pattern some things of all phase acoustic waves, because it's not. Because the dimensions are this internal interface is protected. Yeah. Because the upper, you, are, you have been asking about the lifetime, and of course, if the student is, uh, doesn't care, take much care, he can, he can drop it, but even then, the structure survives. But this internal, internal interface is protected by one millimeter thick glass. It should live as long as this uh, vitrage de Notre-Dame de Paris, in the best case scenario. There's another question from uh, in the audience. Thank you for the nice talk. Uh, can you explain better some more details about the use and the possible observation of the inertial effects uh, in your magnetic system? No. Um, 
this is you see uh, the title this is you see the title of the slide is blue sky outlook so whenever where when when we are there experimentally we are going to to study all to look at this frequency spectra of all the dynamics that we can observe if we see something similar bingo we have observed it but in principle the goal is now uh, just to go with our resonant phonon and magnet interactions which do exist and in case, if we're extremely lucky we are going to do uh to to to, to find these tiny effects but this would be rather like you have been asking other other uh, other day about some strange shape some it will be the minor effect to understand it we need another 10 years oh yeah it is the same it is the same now the biggest issue now is to do uh, but first of all i would say you propose a material where you believe that that it should be the inertia should be observed in this range and then we talk right? because so far now the error bar for this frequency is now exceeds 300 percent according to the last publications right? we cannot go to three terahertz yet yeah exactly uh, uh, as a follow-up on that uh, i mean if you go to these high frequency ranges you will lose on the frequency resolution with your measurement setup no that would be the main issue i think so that would be the biggest challenge probably When I'm saying here, it is not not for fun that we are we are putting here uh, covering should co will cover and already covered our nickel with a few nanometers of gold. This is to improve the detection by designing the sensitivity function that would be still non-zero, yeah? and also to to get an easier fabrication. But you are absolutely right; we are not sure yet. Uh, uh, if the signal uh, will not drop below the signal to noise ratio, yeah, it will. It, it is an issue, yeah, a serious issue. Uh, the only point that I want to, to notice that we have been able to see exchange magnons uh, with frequency of 90 gigahertz. They are observed. So if at 90, if this is why I'm saying if we we should target 100 gigahertz, and this is a range where we can both generate. Uh, exchange magnons with acoustic pulses and detect them optically. Whether we can go to 500 gigahertz, we don't know. Wishful thinking. 